Um, so thank you all for everyone for being here. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Alejandro, who's been a good friend of mine for almost 20 years. Um, we first met at um, Johns Hopkins, where he was doing uh, research after finishing medical school. He then did his internship in, at USC, residency at Hopkins, and then we were lucky enough to convince him to come to Vanderbilt um, when uh, he was looking at fellowships. Um, in fellowship, he was a, a prolific writer. He was a wonderful fellow. Um, if you can uh, subtract the fights he would have with George on a weekly basis, uh, we would call it an ideal time. Um, even since then, he's been a great um, partner, a good friend, um, and helped teach over a dozen fellows and um, multiple dozens of residents. Um, now he's considered to be a world expert on endoscopic ear surgery, um, a world expert on cochlear implant outcomes, and he's pioneering new techniques um, on a uh, yearly basis uh, that makes him a really sought after commodity, enough that, that uh, we've lost him uh, to a uh, competitor here in the upcoming months. Um, I'd be amiss if I didn't talk about him as a great family person. He has two wonderful kids, a uh, wonderful wife. Uh, we've been proud of him and know he'll continue the legacy of uh, David Haynes, Mike Glasscock, and the Autology Group as he moves up to Cleveland. So without further ado, I give you Alejandro. Thank you so much, Mark, and thanks for those words. Uh, they really meant uh, a huge, uh, it's a huge deal um, uh, to me. So I'm going to talk about optimizing outcomes in cochlear implantation. Um, this is a word that has been I worked throughout the years uh, of all of the people in the autology group uh, and all the fellows that have come through. Um, so uh, everybody has chipped in uh, a little bit on all of the data that I will be presenting. Um, oh, uh, next. This is my uh, disclosures. I'm a consultant for Defense Bionics, Cochlear, and Medill. Uh, which I think are relevant for this talk and consultant for these other companies that um, uh, have no bearing. Next. So as you know, cochlear implantations, um, have the indications for cochlear implantation has been expanding over the years. Um, we, began, we began with uh, people having completely uh, profound deafness. Uh, and today we're, we're uh, implanting even much better hearing than this audiogram shows. And so the goal uh, when we do this type of surgery is to be uh, minimally atraumatic uh, so that we can preserve cochlear stru structures. Next. There's several mechanisms of trauma uh, that occur uh, when we put a cochlear implant. Uh, they are acute mechanisms. Uh, which are the ones that are, uh, we are mostly concerned when we're doing the actual procedure. Uh, and so those injuries, I will talk in a second. There's other type of uh, injuries, one, ones that are uh, uh, acute, non, not mechanical, like acoustic trauma from the drilling, uh, from like disruption from the labyrinthine fluid that also happen during surgery. But there's others that are actually... Um, we have very little control at this point, uh, which is the inflammation, for example, that an electric can cause inside the cochlea, uh, the foreign body reaction, the fibrosis that occurs after we put an implant, and the molecular activation and proapoptosis and necrosis pathways that happen inside the cochlea. Uh, and those, I think, that moving forward are our biggest challenges. Next. This is uh, a rendition from um, Rob Briggs that shows, for example, an electrode that has gone into the sprout ligament causing trauma, next. And this one is actually one that has is injured the, the lamina, uh, the sprout lamina right here. I'm oh, sorry, I don't have the cursor. Uh, on, the, on the right side, um, on the, you see the electrode damaging the sprout lamina, and on the left side, um, you see the, the, the other portion of the electrode uh, abudging against the uh, ligament, the spiral ligament. So this is a double whammy. Uh, next. So how do we determine where an electrode array is located in vivo? Next. So you can see here, for example, that um, 
the way we do that is uh, from a software we did that that Rob uh, Labby developed, uh, and um, many of his colleagues in engineering. Um, and what we do is we we created a micro CT model where um, we had different types of copia. With that, we were able to determine where this got vestibuli in in blue, this got tympani in red, and the mariolus in green were. Then we uh, take preoperative images of CTs, and we mer merge those two images. Um, and then after the patient is implanted, we, uh, next, uh, here is um, the, the reconstruction of the preoperative CT scan. Next. Then we take the image of the, um, of the, um, uh, the postoperative CT um, after the patient has been implanted, and we determine where the electrode is, and then we 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 merge all those images together next, uh, and that will tell us where the electrode is in reference to the scar tympani or the scar vestibuli, or if there's translocations. Now today, uh, Rob uh, and uh, Doctor Benoit. Uh, and Dr. Jack Noble have optimized that so that nowadays, uh, for the more, we can we can even do this just with the postoperative CT scan, and, and no need to do it uh, necessarily through all these steps. Next, and so the goal obviously is to be in the next is in to be in the SCA uh, tympani. Uh, next, and prevent uh, the electro from from moving from the scar tympani to the scar vestibuli. That would be called translocation. Next. So when we look at this, when we have a full scar tympani insertion, you can see the electrode is completely on the scar, um, it's completely on the scar tympani uh, in red. Next. And when there's translocations, we can see that the electrode moves from the scar tympani to the scar vestibuli. Next. Now, the important of this type of software is that it will tell us when there is severe trauma. Basically, this is a, the Israhi, um, the Israhi classification of his the histolog of histologic trauma after implantation. In um, the and what we can see with the CT scan is injuries three and four, meaning dislocation of the scar vestibuli or uh, a real fracture of this osseous paralamina uh, or fracture of the basal membrane into uh, of the electrode passing through the through it into the scar vestibuli. Um, the the traumas that are small, like elevation of the basal membrane or rupture of the basal membrane without the the electrode crossing into the scar vestibuli, is hard to identify. Uh, using this this uh, CT um, uh, reconstructions next. So that's how we get to determine where the electrode is, and based on that, we're going to be talking about uh, cochlear implant uh, location and how that impacts performance and hearing preservation. Next. Uh, next. Okay, so let's focus first on uh, performance. Okay, so let's focus first on location. And so when we look at location, uh, we, uh, a while ago, uh, Brandon Connell and George Juana and the, the entire ontology group work on this paper looking at the electrolocation uh, of um, 220 cochlear, implant, cochlear implants. Um, uh, in determining if the angular depth of insertion was a predictor of outcomes. And for that, we did a postlingually adult, we took postlingually adult CA recipients uh, that underwent pre and post operative CT scans uh, and did a multivariate analysis. Next. As I said, we ended up uh, collecting 220 um, uh, implants placed out of 184 patients. Uh, and what what our rate of scar tympan insertion at the time was 68%. Uh, 
Now it was, people would say, well, that's kind of low these day and ages, but next, uh, I, when we did this, this, this um, study, we were taking a lot of both new and what I would call uh, nowadays old electrodes. So we had the Flex 28, which is an electrode that we're currently putting from the metal company. But we also use the standard, the Combi 40 and the medium, which are much bulkier and heavy electrodes. From Cochlear Corporation, we use um, the Contour Advance, uh, which again is an all bulky electrode compared to Slim J, uh, which is a straight array. Um, and the, in Advanced Bionics, we use the Mid Sky and the YJ. So if you look over here on this, in this group, there's two electrodes that were not available and that we're currently using. One is a, a Slim J, which is a, 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 it's a straight array, uh, slim, straight array, and the CI532 from Cochlear, which is a slim permodular array. And that, that concept is important because those, especially this, the, the 532, has given, given us new insight into um, outcomes that we will talk at the in the second portion of this talk. Next. So when we look at that paper, we concluded uh, one of the things that we encountered was that um, that angular insertion depth, or in other words, how deep that insertion goes into the cochlea, um, is uh, does not affect translocation. Uh, we had similar amounts of sky tympani insertions with um, sky vestibuli uh, translocations. Uh, when we when we look at um, uh, at depth of insertion next. Now, what we did encounter was that um, using a lateral wall electrode, meaning a straight array electrode, is um, uh, give us uh, give us uh, placement in the sky tympani of about ninety six percent of the time, compared to uh, pre curve arrays, which are this two, which is the premodular on the mid in the mid uh, portion and a mid scalar uh, on the right side. Next, next. And whether we use a round window approach or any other technique was also uh, statistically significant in a sense that if we use a round window approach or a, or a extend the round window, uh, we were more frequently in the sky tympani compared to when we use cochleosomy which showed uh, uh, more frequent translocations. Next. Next. So why does that, why, why does that happen? And why, why do we think that that is important? So this is important because, um, uh, next. Um, that is important because we, what we've seen and, and many others have seen uh, is that using our proposal um, technique is operator dependent, meaning uh, if you see in this rendition uh, of or in this photograph of the round window, you can see that the round window is fairly uh, is hard to see. Uh, not everybody uncovers the niche of the round window, and if you don't uncover the niche of the round window, you might put the electrode uh, to anterior, which is the image uh, on the middle. Uh, where in reality, what you want to be is anterior inferior, which is the image on the right. Next. And Adonke and Buckman did this paper uh, sending, um, sending uh, questionnaires to the neurotology community. Uh, and what they showed uh, was that everybody uh, was putting the electrodes in different places, uh, as you can see in the pie graph on the right. Next. So that brings us to conclusion one, which is lateral wall electrodes designs uh, have the highest rate of sky tympani insertion, uh, and you should use a round window or extend round window approach as it also maintains the electrode more frequently in the sky tympani. And at least from, look, from the location perspective, um, how deep we put an electrode uh, doesn't impact 
whether it translocates or not. Next. So with that in mind, let's talk about why is that important? So why is it important that we to have a SCA timpani uh, instruction next? Uh, and so with that, we're gonna look specifically at performance uh, on those patients that had Scatting pain insertion versus translocation, next. And also look at whether uh, insertion depth matters or not, next. Going back to that paper that uh, we wrote uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Wana and Dr. O'Connell, uh, what we saw was that uh, we had a scatting pain insertion um, the, those patients who had a SCAT in insertion had an improved CNC scores uh, in red uh, uh, and on the left side compared to uh, the ones that translocated in blue. Uh, in, in the group on the right side, uh, uh, that was also true for AZ bio scores uh, in red uh, for SCAT in insertions compared to uh, SCAT vestibuli. Next. And why, do, why does that uh, impact speech perception? Well, because if you have a sky vestibular insertion that causes trauma to the terminal endings uh, of the nerve structures. But also more important, next, is the fact that if you have a sky tympani uh, insertion, you're gonna be stimulating the sparaganglion cells that are directly located uh, beside, in, at the level of that of that uh, scala, um, and that's why you see um, in the electrode inferiorly. Uh, but if you use a scala tympani, uh, a scala if you do an scala vestibular insertion, which is the electrode on top, you see that there is stimulation both of the on the uh, spiral ganglion cells uh, of the basal turn uh, as well as of the apical turn. Uh, and so you might, that can cause some mismatch. Next. Now, does depth of insertion impact speech recognition scores? Next. And when we pull all the data together from all the different companies, we, we might say, well, it doesn't really look that like, uh, I don't, there's not a clear correlation of whether, uh, how deep an insert, uh, an electric goes, uh, impacts, um, uh, performance next, but when we we subtract and we look spe at specific companies, um, since they are the same type of electrode, just longer, uh, we gather uh, a very insightful information. And what we see is that, for example, when we took all the metal um, uh, implants, um, and we have the standard, which is a thirty-one millimeter electrode the Flex 28, which is a um, uh, 28 millimeter, millimeter electrode, and a Flex 24, which is a 24 millimeter electrode, we can see that uh, those that are longer, the, the, the green ones, um, do better compared to those that um, are shorter, which are the red, uh, in terms of CNC, percentage of CNC scores. So, so N, next. If we look specifically about at, at Cochlear's, uh, uh, a Cochlear's um, device, and in this case, we use the, the Slim J electrode at the time we were using the CI422. Again, we see a very nice correlation uh, telling us that, that uh, the deeper the insertion, meaning the deeper the, the, um, uh, the angular depth of insertion, um, the better uh, the electric performance, performance with electric stimulation. Next. What happens with a precurve array? So we look at the contour advance, and in this particular case, we didn't seem to uh, find uh, much of a, a correlation. And so when we did this paper, and so this was done uh, about three years ago, four years ago, um, at the time, we, we, we concluded that, that, that it was elect the, the, the angular depth of, of, of insertion and how that impacts um, 
performance was electric electro dependent that it matter if where you use a straight array but it didn't necessarily matter if you use a um a pre-curve array and with the new data that we have available that thought and that observation has changed and we'll talk about about that a little bit later next so why would a graded depth of insertion impact speech scores? Well, because it increased cochlear coverage, uh, because it extends uh, the range of possible pitch percepts, and because the better the frequency match with tonopo with tonotopic uh, organization of the cochlea, the better performance. Now, we don't know what is the upper limit of that insertion depth. And it might be that, that if we put an electrode that is too deep, we will be starting to cause trauma at the very apical terms of the cochlea, uh, which would uh, at the same time start causing the, the, a decline in performance. Next. And the other variables that, that uh, uh, Dr. O'Connell noticed was that, um, was that age was an important factor. The, better, the, the lower the age, the better the performance, uh, at least on CNC scores. Next. So that brings us to conclusion two, which is scattering and insertion and greater insertion depths and younger age are associated with superior cochlear implant speech perceptions. And as I said, at that time, we thought that angular depth of insertion was electrode dependent, um, that it, it, it will hold true for straight arrays, but not necessarily for pre-curve arrays. Next. Good, so now let's talk about hearing preservation. How does the location, next. Uh, sorry, how does the location um, impacts um, uh, hearing preservation? And again, with that, uh, George, um, uh, uh, wrote this paper uh, looking at preoperative residual hearing uh, and um, um, uh, on patients that, that had functional preservation. And we call functional preservation those that had ADDV uh, or better at 250 hertz. Next. So with that, we ended up at the time with 36 patients. Um, and what this showed was that 49% of patients had hearing preservation had hearing preservation. Um, despite 85 of them, despite having 85 that had an actual uh, insertion on the sky timpani. So what that tells us is that it's not only imp it's not only important to be in the sky timpani. Next, uh, but it is, there's other uh, injuries that happen inside the 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 sky timpani that decrease that preservation from 85% to 45%. Uh, and that is when elect where electrocochlography or other, in or other um, electrophysiologic measures might help us improve our hearing preservation rates. And on that paper, some of the data that we found was that if you ended up in the sky, in the sky vestibuli, uh, the image on the right, then you're gonna have 0% of preservation. So what that means is that the, the, the most important factor of hearing preservation uh, or, or the, the most initial factor on hearing preservation is that you do not translocate that electrode. Um, and, this, and even when you translocate, when, even when, when you preserve those, uh, you maintain that electrode in the sky timpani, uh, we only preserve in about 60% of the cases. Next. So does insertion depth impact hearing preservation? Next. And again, we go back to the, our, our study uh, from, from Dr. O'Connell uh, looking at Medel devices. And we can see again that on, um, uh, the, on, on the y-axis, we, we, we can see that we're looking at low frequency PTA shift um, and on the x-axis, angular depth of insertion. And you see that uh, again, those patients who now those patients who have a shorter array have 
the smallest amount of PTA shift. What that means is that the, the shorter the electrode, the better the preservation uh, when compare the Flex 28, 24, which gives us the best preservation compared to the 28 in blue and the standard in green. Next. Now, what about longer term preservation? How does that impact? Um, how does that impact uh, things, uh, human preservation over time? Uh, and in, in this audiograms, you can see, we want to make sure that it occurs pre-op on activation and beyond. And ideally, more than a year beyond, which is most of the data we, that we have available. Uh, next. So regarding that, uh, Alex Sweeney, um, on his, um, uh, uh, when he was here at Vanderbilt, look at the durability of human preservation after cochlear implantation using conventionally length electrodes. And so again, we took, uh, we included patients uh, that we have preserved hearing on our, at activation. And we look at the audiometric, and they had to have audiometric file for over at six months. And all of those patients needed to be in the SCAD timpani. Um, and we look at the uh, uh, shift of the low frequency PTA. Next. We ended up at the time with 16 implants. Uh, and as you can see, that low frequency PTA went from 57.5 dB per op. Um, to 74, uh, 74 dB at activation and 80 to at last viable. Now remember, these, is, these were standard uh, devices. So we're not only talking about the slim electrodes, we're looking at a even bulkier electrodes than that. Uh, and that explains why, whereas to begin with, we have a pretty low preoperative uh, hearing preservation, but why also we have a, about a, a 20 dB drop. Next. Next. And when he did this paper, the single most important point of this paper was that what we encountered next was a stylated electro array uh, was a, um, uh, was um, show that had, was a, a poor, it was a negative um, uh, result showing that uh, those stylated arrays uh, do not um, preserve hearing very well. Next. So that brings us to conclusion three, which is cava vestibular insertions precludes preservation of hearing. Greater insertion depths associated with, are associated with worse hearing preservation. And stellate electrodes impact negatively long-term preservation of hearing. Next. So we put all this together. Then we can send a lot of wall electrodes and run window um, uh, uh, approaches, increase the likelihood of SCAD timpani insertion. And that is the single most important uh, point of good outcomes. Um, being in the SCAD timpani, it is the most important factor of, of, of um, preservation of hearing and better speech perception. So I would, I would, I would say that that is, um, the most impactful uh, point when you put in a cochlear implant. In greater angle insertion depth, depths are predictive of better speech perception, um, but loss of residual hearing. Next. So we ended up having to make a decision every time we end up putting in an implant, which is, do we want to preserve hearing? Uh, and if so, you might consider doing a shorter array, or do you want better electric stimulation and better electric um, speech perceptions? Um, and if so, then you might consider using a longer array. That is specifically true for straight arrays. Next. Now, with the new non stylated pre curve electro, things have changed, and that has given us a different type of insight. Uh, and so now I'm going to focus specifically about this, this non stylated pre curve array that we use with a sheath that goes inside the cochlea. Next. 
So of those, when we look at our, when I look at the data the last time, we had 97 ears um, uh, that had been implanted, and we at the time that we look at that I look at this data, we had 56 CT uh, CTs done on those 97 patients. And to begin with, we only found four translocations, so seven percent of translocations, which Compared to a stylated precurve array, we're talking on a range from 7% translocation to 40% translocation. So the, the non-stylated precurve array is actually an electrode that stays in the SCADA tympani 93% of the time. So it's comparable to any uh, stray array, which is, which is an important point. Now, it does have more incidence of default overs. Uh, we have 5% uh, 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 of tick followers in our group. Next. And when we compare to, a to some of the, the uh, data that we show uh, that we've uh, published on this paper with other types of electrodes, in here we did not include the, the um, CA532 or 632. Other electro arrays, the rate is 1.8% of, uh, of tip foldovers. So the one thing about this electron is that we have to be very careful with tip foldovers when we use it, as it has a higher incidence of it. Next. And the way, uh, and this array is interesting in the sense that uh, you have to have, be uh, careful when you put it in. This implant, when it was launched in the market, um, had a 20 degree uh, gain between where the 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 she the where the um, wing needed to be in reference to the electrode, so um, um, we, if you see right here uh, where I'm holding the electrode, uh, and Kim, can you uh, uh, turn it on again? Thank you. Uh, when you see it right here, I'm advancing it. The, the, the wing is tilting 20 degrees and the electric is now coming, um, should be coming what I consider, what it would be coming perpendicular to the modiolus. So when this electric was launched, we, we were told that the wing needed to be coplanar to the, to, the, to the exit of the electrode. And obviously in this particular electrode that was not happening. So when you put this electrode, it's very important. And every time you put it, you play with it. You take out the, the you, you deploy the electrode and put it back in and make sure that that electrode is actually coming coplanar uh, the, to the wing so that you put the electrode in the right axis. And that will, that on its own will prevent a lot of the tilt fold overs. Next. Um, as I said, non stellated precurve erectors have similar intrascalar tympan location as compared to straight arrays. Next. And if so, how does this impact speech performance outcomes? Next. So with this, uh, Jordan Holder uh, uh, wrote this beautiful paper uh, looking at comparing um, electrodes from the same company. So we compare CI422s, so, so uh, slim, uh, slim straight arrays, compared to non stellated precurve arrays, the CI532. Uh, and she, what she did was a match uh, control study when, where she took 29 patients of both groups uh, and she matched them by age, uh, preoperative low frequency PTA, uh, preoperative CNC scores and data logging. And as you can see, uh, for both groups, the age of implantation was about 69 years. The preoperative low frequency PTA was 84 um, dBHL uh, for one group and 83 for the other, which is not significant. The preoperative CNC score was five and seven respectively and was not significant. And data logging was 12 hours for both groups. Uh, next. Uh, and what we saw uh, next is that on CNC scores, uh, the patients who had a 532 
uh, which is the black dots, do better, uh, have better percent correct uh, CNC scores uh, compared to that, those who receive a 422. And all of these are patients, by the way, that are in the SCAD timpani. So again, we are, what we're showing here is that the closer to the medulles, the better the performance. How do we, how can we look into that? And, and how, how does that, why do we see that on, on pre-curve, on non study pre-curve array, and we do not see it on, on uh, straight arrays? Next. Next. So this is a paper that, that uh, Dr. Gifford uh, and Dr. Uh, Chakraborty uh, uh, wrote, um, and Dr. Labri, looking at the proximity, the modular proximity of the uh, precurved arrays. And so for this paper, we're looking at mid-modular distance. And we, when, when we talk about mid-modular distance, we're, we're taking three different points, a basal point, a more midpoint and an apical point uh, distance to the modulus. We average it and that's the mid-modular distance. Uh, and this is an automated uh, information that we get from our software. And when we, can, when we do that, we see two things. When they published this, this paper, we saw things that we've already talked about, like full scale, full scale timpani insertion is a predictor of better performance and that is significant. We see that gender, uh, sorry, we see that age of implantation uh, is predictor of important, of, of good performance. The better the age, the better the performance. But what we also saw uh, next is this, is that mean, mean modular distance is a very important predictor of good outcome. The closer to the modulus, the better the performance. And since this is an average measure, the mean modular distance is an average measure, the question is, how much, how closer do, do we need to be? Uh, or in other words, how far can we be from the modulars to still get the best possible outcome? Next. And this other paper uh, by, uh, doc, by Dr. Burke and uh, Dr. Giffer gives us that answer. Uh, when they did this paper, they showed, they, they were looking at, um, uh, the, the AZ Bio uh, in nose maxima, they were comparing 16 channels versus 18, eight channels. And what they saw next is that there was an impactful improvement uh, on outcomes uh, when they use, uh, when the mid modular distance was um, closer than 0.6. Uh, millimeters to the modulus. Next. So what that means is that it's very different to have a pre-curve array being very close to the modulus, less than 0.6 from the modulus to the, to, to the electrode, to the, the actual contact. Uh, in this particular case, we had 0.36 millimeters as a mid modular distance compared to the one the image on the right where you have 0.6 millimeters of mean modular distance and you can see that this electric is over insertion with this is really a pre-curve array it's not really a pre-modular array the 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 as the the, the electrode is turning you have it it becomes really a lateral wall electrode and as it continues to turn towards the apex it go it becomes again perimodular so that this 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 insertion we I, I would call a pre-curve insertion, um, but not necessarily a perimodular. Really, a perimodular insertion is what we have on the left, where we have a very close proximity of the electrode to the modulus. Next, and we we notice that that uh, has taken us time to master. So this is uh, uh, data. Uh, looking at the reduction of the electrode to the modular distance uh, using the pull-through technique. So for the first year almost uh, of us doing, and I think that this is only my data, um, when I started doing this electrode, I was actually over-insertion the 532 
pretty much in mo most of the cases, and I had a, a pretty high uh, mid modular distance. But nowadays, what we're doing is we're putting the, the electrode and pulling back a little bit. And when you do that, you bring the electrode closer to the modulus, which is what uh, the, 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 this demonstrate on the left, on the left side, next. Um, and on the right side, you can see the comparison on when we use pullback technique compared to non-pullback technique that we improve uh, the mid modular distance. Now, that's one point. What, what the, all, the other point that I'd advocate is that also when you do a little bit of a pullback technique, the, I do believe that we decrease the rate of transload of uh, tip foldovers because we readjust the electrode and we have, when, if we were to have a little bit of a tip foldover right at the tip, we might be able to adjust that just by that little pullback. But that's something that we haven't demonstrated. Next. Here, for example, you, you'll see what I mean by a pullback technique. When we go in, this is, uh, um, um, this is the left here. Uh, you can see uh, the, uh, uh, the round window. I have this articulated the, wind, the, the, the membrane, and I do that for all my cases uh, that I do a, a CI, CI 532 or 632 so that the sheath doesn't buckle and the electro goes in easily. We put it in. Um, now I'm going to advance the array uh, and match the two white marks that you see on the electrode. Now it's now it is the sheet is inside the cochlea. There's a little bit of a gusher. And then we're gonna advance the electrode. It goes in, pull the sheath out. And as I'm pulling, I'm going to pull back that electrode a little bit so that the white mark is either at the level there. I just pull it back right there and it's at the level of the recess or a little bit outward, a little bit lateral to the recess. Um, with that, uh, that's the pull, pull back and that, that allows us to get the electrode closer to the modules. Next. Now, we've also found, this is a uh, paper published by Matt Detman, showing uh, that it's not only important um, pulling, pulling the electrode back, but also uh, the way you pack it is important. So on this paper, what we saw is that if we pack, this is now a right ear, so the feet of the patient are, are uh, on the right side, the head is on the left side, uh, the nose is, uh, in the top of the image and uh, the uh, back of the head uh, is on the back of the image. And so you see here that uh, you see the, the facial recess and you see that the electrode is placed inferiorly with the packing superiorly on the recess. And that is the ideal way of implanting uh, this electrode. I'll show you the video that shows this next. So this is a, a 532 perimodal in, insertion. We put it in, in. Here we're doing the insertion into the model. We take it, we, we take it out. And you're going to see what happens when we pack it superiorly. Now we're packing it superiorly. And the electrode on the basal portion uh, of, the, uh, of the cochlea is going to move towards the modiolus. Now we're gonna pack it inferiorly, and when we pack it inferiorly, pack the recess inferiorly, the electro goes superiorly on the, on the recess, then it moves away from it. And so again, if we want a peri uh, modular insertion, we need to make sure that we pack 
we put the electrode in the inferior portion of the facial recess and we pack it superiorly. Next. And the last thing that we saw was that now that we can, we very um, consistently put the electrode in the scar timpani with a precurve array, and we can make a consistent uh, insertion closer to the modiolus, we see that, that now this precurve array actually, how did, how did the insertion is, impacts the CNC score's performance. And here we can see a very nice correlation showing that the deeper the angular depth of insertion, the better the performance. Next. Next. How about here in preservation? Next. So this was done by um, this. At the beginning, I was very skeptical about using this type of electrode for hearing preservation cases, as I thought that putting an electron inside the cochlea, or not an electron, putting a sheath inside the cochlea might carry some dam damage to it. Uh, and so um, the first case that I did was on this child who was four years old and had had a progressive decline in her hearing over time. And so I was in a conundrum because I was thinking, well, she has very good low frequency hearing, but all these mid and high frequencies have been rapidly declining over the last year and a half. So should I go for a, a, a should I go for hearing preservation? Should I go for a better uh, a speech electric, better electric stimulation um, scores? And so what we did is we decided to implant the right ear first with a uh, with a straight array, um, and we were able to preserve her hearing. So for the second side, I decided, well, for this ear, I'm gonna give her the best possible output that I can think I can give her um, with, a fully elect with a full band uh, electrode. Um, and that's why I decided to use the 532. And so we, I used that electrode and I was fortunate that I was able to preserve her residual hearing. And here you can see her scores uh, six months after implantation, uh, baby bio inquired went up uh, to 87%, it noise to 60%, and when we put an EAS um, processor, uh, then uh, it increased by 20%, 20 points. Uh, next. And we look, when we look at, at our uh, preliminary, data, preliminary data on hearing preservation with this electrode, you can see that uh, the first uh, line is uh, no changes on um, uh, low frequency PTA shift. Um, and the second line is a change of 15 decibels. And what we see with this, with, with this electrode is that over time, uh, this is the, the graph on the left is at activation, the right in the middle is six months, and the, right on the, the, uh, the graph on the right is at 12 months. You can see that we have pretty good preservation of low frequency PTA over time um, with uh, both um, uh, over time with this electrode uh, of about with a shift of about 15 decibels. Uh, next. So what we can conclude with this is that in order to optimize speech perception scores, it's imperative, imper, Im, imperative to number one stay in the sky timpani. That is the single most important point. You need to be in the sky timpani uh, to optimize speech perceptions and to preserve hearing, by the way. So that is the most important point. Now, if you achieve that, if you use an electrode to achieve, an electrode that achieves that, then being close to the modules is the second, a secondary very important point. So, if you, the number goal, the, the goal number one doing an insertion should be to be in the sky timpani. The goal number two should be to stay close to the modulus as possible, ideally less than 0.6 millimeters. And then when you have both of those, a deeper insertion also will improve outcomes. So a, a, a deeper insertion is something that you might want. And in terms of human preservation, 
we can say that now it's possible not only to uh, maintain human preservation with a lateral wall electrode, but also with non stellated precurve arrays. Uh, and, that, and that preservation is actually maintained over time. Next. Now with that, um, we've had a lot of collaborators over the years. Um, obviously this work would not be possible without Rob Lavity, George Wana, Mark Bennett, David Haynes, Jake Hunter, Brandon O'Connell, Alex Sweeney, Matt Detman, Robert Yon, Geraldine Suniga, Ashley Nasiri, uh, Rene, Jordan, Bob, uh, Jack, uh, Benoit, uh, and, and all of our statisticians that have involved in this. In this. Um, with that in mind, uh, if you have, if you guys have any questions, um, we're we're happy to uh, hear them, or uh, you, you can put in write them in the chat. Kim will write, will we read them, uh, and then we'll we'll answer them. I've also enabled participant audio. It looks like we have um, appropriate people participating today. So you can unmute yourself to uh, ask a question. Great, perfect. Hey, Alejo, it's Rob here. Hey, Rob. Um, that's a very nice job of summarizing a decade plus of work. And as you know, things continue to evolve. And uh, there's two points that I, I want to bring up, and the primary authors of those papers are on the call as well. Uh, the first one is uh, Will Morrell, who uh, recently had a paper accepted looking at straight electrode arrays that are supposed to be on the lateral wall and uh, found that at, there's a certain cutoff angular insertion depth that's right about 600 degrees and when that happens they tend to hit the undersurface of the basal membrane and, and performance declines at that point so I think there is a cutoff at which depth matters and, and, and you alluded to that but maybe Will can comment on that and then the other comment is uh, Jordan Holder has done a very nice job as the uh, second project for her PhD thesis, really summarizing all of the data over the last decade plus in clinical questions that audiologists are, are interested in hearing. And she found a very interesting finding that the more people use their cochlear implant, the better they do. So with this data logging, We've been telling patients, yeah, use them for eight hours, use them for 10 hours. Well, the reality is if you keep them on while you're awake, you do much better as, as long as your uh, use uh, improves. So perhaps Will and Jordan can comment on those. Um, sure, yeah. On the uh, first paper you referenced, we did find that after about 585 degrees or so, it seemed like the rate of translocation went up pretty significantly which um, may not be too surprising, uh, just given the, we, we think, given the size of the skull timpani at that point. Um, and we did some sort of preliminary work into predicting where that point would be for an individual's cochlea based on the size of their skull timpani and sort of the individual scala anatomy. Um, and so we had some sort of interesting results there, but uh, definitely need more work to create a better predictive model. Um, Will, did you when when you look at that? Did you um, do you do you take into account the volume of the of the most apical apical uh, turns, and did you find a correlation of the volume with their perform with their performance? So we looked at um, a couple different measurements of the scala timpani. We thought about looking at sort of uh, cross-sectional area or the height of the scala timpani. Other groups had looked at the height, specifically at the lateral wall versus the medialis. What we ended up doing was um, creating cross-sectional images uh, from some of the software that Jack and Dr. Labdi had built. Um, and then uh, imagining that you placed a circle uh, with a 
approximately the diameter of the apical tip of an electrode. And you place that within the confines of the scala tympani and you push it as laterals, it will go while staying within the uh, confines of the scala. Um, and then we measured two things. One is we measured how far away from the lateral wall that would sit. And then we said, if you let it go all the way to the lateral wall of the scala tympani, but you let it transgress across the basilar membrane into the scala vestibuli, how much would that transgress into uh, vestibuli? And we called that basilar membrane displacement. So those were the two sort of measurements that we made um, and tracked those uh, as you move basally to eight sort of every 45 degrees of angular depth uh, for each of the um, patients in the study. Very nice. Alejo, this is uh, David Haynes. What do you think the next question we, we need to answer with cochlear implants is, or questions? There's, there's always, we're always working on something what do you what do you think i mean i think i think i i think that we're already working on it uh i think that that there is um as i said i think that that we have when we when we look at at, at uh, being able to um uh, prevent trauma uh more and more we're being able to achieve that um but nonetheless we still causing some degree of injury uh, to the uh, intracochlear structures, not necessarily mechanical trauma um, or, or maybe mechanical trauma to some degree, um, but, but due to foreign body reactions, due to fibrosis, due to displacement of the basal membrane. Um, so, so we've achieved, uh, uh, preventing uh, big traumas. Um, uh, if we go back to that image on the, the histologic scale, uh, trauma of grade three and fours, but we still uh, not able to prevent traumas uh, in the one and twos. Uh, and certainly, and so anything that is related to number one, uh, being able to identify that type of injury um, and, and, and uh, I love to hear Rob's uh, thoughts on this and Renee's thoughts on this. Um, I think I don't, I don't see necessarily um, imaging getting us there uh, to identify that type of um, minimal trauma. Um, and so we need to have, we need to have electrophysiologic measures accompany that, uh, that are reliable and consistent um, to, pre to prevent that type of trauma and get better outcomes. And obviously, everything that comes along with prevention uh, of, of, of that trauma. Now, that's, one, that's just one area. Then on the other area, then we have, uh, the other area we have, um, we have um, molecular ways to uh, decrease inflammation and decrease uh, apoptosis. I think that's that, or, um, molecular ways of stimulating nerve endings uh, to, um, to, uh, to improve outcomes even further. So all those are things, are, are things that uh, I know that we are working on um, uh, and that, and that uh, I think it's uh, part of the next step. Uh, Alejo, I, I think you're spot on. I think that we're at the limits of human abilities putting these electrodes in now and we need some type of micro manipulator that allows us to make very small changes in motion in a very stable fashion while we're recording some type of electrophysiological response when you look at comparable fields like neurosurgery where we're putting in these deep brain stimulators blindly they use micro manipulators and the position where they put it is not as crucial as what we do. So we really need new tools. And, and there's a number of groups working on that here at Vanderbilt. Marlon Hansen has an interesting robot that gets implanted into the mastoid and slowly inserts over time. The concept being that you put an electrode array in 
almost at a hybrid length, and then over time you slowly insert it if the hearing goes down. But I really think that we need uh, additional tools. Any other questions? It's a great talk, Alejandro. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And it's good to talk to you, at least see your names and hope to hear your voices through um, uh, the computer. <laughs>